This is Lauren Dunlap, Executive Director for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, or ADA, in Charlotte, North Carolina. I am so happy to host today's webinar on this spring sunny day in Charlotte, North Carolina, and also a lot of the rest of the country as well are having great weather. Today's webinar is um, on multiple sclerosis and specialty pharmacies, an overview of care and treatment. ADA's mission is to create awareness, advocacy, and conduct research to help the greater 25 million Americans living with immune disorders. ADA's worked to promote research and create better awareness of immune disorders. This is ADA's fourth webinar of 12 for 2021, and I will be joined today by Alexis Okuri, Flavia Pasca, and Larissa Melnick who are third-year pharmacy students at Neomed. And ladies, I'm just going to read your bios right quick and tell you our audience a little bit about you. Alexis Curie is currently a third-year pharmacy student at Northeast Ohio Medical University, or Neomed, and is scheduled to receive a PharmaD in spring of 2022. She earned her undergraduate degree Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry at Youngstown State University. Alexis is co-founder and president of Neomed Student Association of Specialty Pharmacy. In the future, she plans to specialize in neurological conditions and autoimmune disorders. Flavia Pasca is a third-year pharmacy student studying at Neomed and is on track to receive her PharmD in the spring semester of 2022. Also, she earned her Bachelor of Science at Cleveland State University. Blavia is also co-founder and vice president of Neomed Student Association of Specialty Pharmacy. She is interested in becoming a clinical pharmacist and specializing in neurology. Larissa Melnick is a third-year pharmacy student also at Neomed with a background in engineering technology and entrepreneurship. Her goal after graduation is to use those skills toward improving specialty pharmacy opportunity. Ladies, please proceed with your webinar. Thank you very much, Lauren, for the introduction, and we just want to thank you for having us here. We're very excited to be here. So as Lauren had mentioned, we are doing our presentation on multiple sclerosis. So I just wanted to check right quick and make sure everybody can hear us okay. Can you type yes in the box if you can uh, hear our pres presenters? Great. Thank you, Kennedy. Okay, go ahead, ladies. Okay, can, can everybody hear me good? Were you okay to continue? Yep. Okay, great. All good. Okay, so our presentation is multiple sclerosis and specialty pharmacy and overview of care and treatment. So to start off with, um, sorry, let me see, here we go. Here's our objectives today. So we're going to define what multiple sclerosis is. We're going to discuss some current therapies and some future therapies. And we also want to talk about some um, patient assistance programs for prescription coverage, as well as for disease management. So who is affected by MS? So greater than 2.3 million people worldwide or greater than 1 million in the US. There is a two to one of female to male, so it is more common in females than it is in males. Um, it's typically diagnosed between the ages of 20 to 40, but it can be diagnosed in adolescence as well as after the age of 40. It is most commonly occurring in um, people of white descent and ancestry, so from Northern European areas. And the farther away you are from the equator, it seems to be that there's a higher incidence. So looking at this um, kind of a map here, just wanted to show that the area in orange here, the Midwest, and then the area in the Northern, Northeastern areas of the US here, the higher incidences that you can see, so the Northeastern has 377 per 100,000 residents, and the Midwest has 353 per 100,000 residents. And then as you get farther away from the equator, as well as towards the West, those numbers drop a little bit, which is very interesting to me that it has something to do with like environmental and um, the positioning away from the equator. There was a large international study that showed that each 10 degree increase from the equator was associated with a 10 month decrease in the age at onset of MS. So it seems like the farther you are away, the earlier MS seems to be um, showing its symptoms at onset. So looking at the etiology or the cause and risk factors. So it's not 100% known what causes MS. Um, there's some ideas and some that are more 
um, have more evidence than others, I would say. But um, a genetic increase, so if a family member has um, MS, you do have an increase in the risk of getting it yourself. If you have a sibling with it, you have a 5% increase. If you have a twin, then it's a 25% increase, which is also very interesting to me. So looking at the environmental, as I had mentioned, um, geographic location seems to be a factor. But also if you're exposed to smoking, um, like secondhand smoke or industrial type pollutants, toxins and pollutants, for example, um, most pesticides are actually neurotoxic agents. And a lot of them can cause irreversible damage to your brain, to your spinal cord, any of your neurons. So it's definitely something that we should probably look into more. There's not, like I said, there's not a lot of data for a lot of the causes at, to MS, but it is something that's very interesting to look at what different factors can increase these risks. Um, as I had mentioned, some industrial pollutants. So like glues, solvents, some stains, those also have very similar neurotoxic effects that the pesticides have. And I want to talk about infectious agents. So this seems to be the most common theory for what causes MS or what causes autoimmune disorders in general. Epstein-Barr virus seems to be the most common one that causes neurological conditions. So Epstein-Barr is the virus that causes mono. This is associated with a neurological illness called, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but um, Guillain-Barre. And this is a rare but serious acute neurological illness. It's the immune system will basically attack the peripheral nervous system. And I think that this is a very similar um, like cause to how MS is because it's an autoimmune reaction against the myelin sheath. Only instead of it being in the central nervous system, this is the peripheral nervous system. There are other illnesses that are associated with neurological deficit in um, people that have had mono or the Epstein-Barr virus, and that is um, including like cranial or ner facial nerve palsies. So it's like numbness on one side or lack of um, ability to move that area. Encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, optic neuritis, which is swelling of the optic nerve, or viral meningitis. So that's a swelling of the meninges or the tissue that covers the brain and spinal cord. And lastly, there was hemiplegia, which is paralysis on one side of the body. And then lastly, some personal or family history of migraines or autoimmunity. So people that have an autoimmune disorder are automatically at an increased risk of developing other autoimmune disorders. And then I found that migraines was very interesting. Um, there's a lot of data that suggests that migraines can cause inflammation in your brain and micro damage that is similar to lesions. Um, so it's very interesting how they have a tie in with MS. So what is MS? I've been talking about it a lot. So let's go ahead and get into what it is. So it is an autoimmune disease and it's where the immune system attacks and damages the myelin. So myelin is kind of like the protective barrier around our axons, which is part of our nerve cells. And in order for it to conduct its signals, so if you think about a um, like a plug and a cord on an electrical item that you have like your computer or your TV, anything like that, you have that inside of it that conducts the electricity and you have the plastic over it that allows that to conduct properly through the entire stream. So our nerves are the same way. They have this protective myelin sheath around it that allows the signals to be sent from one place to another. So looking at the pathophysiology, I know there's a lot on this slide and I wanted to show you the technical terms for everything and then we're gonna break it down. So if you're looking at the humoral immunity, um, this is going to be the antibodies. So there's autoreactive B cells and there's plasma cells. These cells will be brought information that says there's something going on here that shouldn't be happening. There's either a um, like a damaging cell or there's something that's going to cause damage to the body. So these will then produce these um, autoantibodies. So the autoantibodies are what's going to attack the myelin sheath or it's going to cause the demyelination of our central nervous system. And then we have another form of immunity called cell mediated. So this is where you're going to have the CD4, there's Th1 and Th17 cells. So these are our T helper cells and there's specific T helper cells that seem to be prevalent in MS. We also have some interferons, some cytokines, and what these do, they cause a cascade effect. So it's one thing happens, it occurs, then this happens, and then this happens. And then this cascade then causes the same result that we saw in our humoral immunity, where it's attacking that myelin sheath in patients with MS. So going on to the next part, 
Here I have these little cells to show you how our immune system detects self versus non-self. So this is going to be the self marker here, and this is an antigen. Usually our cells will recognize our self cells as friends and they'll leave them alone. They don't bother with them. They can move past it without thinking, okay, this is gonna cause us damage. They just, they're basically happy cells. So then you look at this angry cell here and it notices this antigen. And this is where it marks it as non-self or foe. And typically in a normal immune system, this will be pretty efficient. So our self cells are generally left alone and anything that looks to be damaging or foreign will then be targeted for degradation or to be destroyed basically. So if we go on to our next part, we have the humoral response as we had mentioned before and the cellular response. So I kind of wanted to show you kind of a diagram here just to make it seem a little bit more, I don't know, like an easier way to um, understand it. So we have this foreign body, or something that the body recognizes as non-self. It's detected by antigen presenting cells or macrophages and dendri dendritic cells. So these cells will then take this foreign body, they basically eat it, and then they bring it to this T helper cell saying, something's wrong here, please help me get rid of this. So then the T helper cell produces these cytokines or these chemical signals that are then sent out. It's basically like a message to the other cells. So the B cells will receive that and they will then create these antibodies that will then target the cells to go and attack that foreign body or the non-self cell. And then also those cytokines that were sent will be sent to the cytotoxic T cell. The cytotoxic T cells, instead of making antibodies, they actually go and they attack it themselves. So um, these are the two different ways that we can see the same response. So in a normal immune system, this is going to be happening towards viruses or bacteria or even cancer cells. But in an autoimmune state, these cells are then going to target your own cells. So in MS, it's targeting the myelin sheath and the central nervous system cells. So looking at how that happens, so we have this neuron here or this nerve cell. So this is where the myelin is, right here along this. And these are the antibodies that were made by our plasma and B cells. These antibodies then target the myelin, see how they're attached here. And this then signals for all of the other immune cells to come and attack this because it's now marked as non-self or as a dangerous cell. So even though these are our protective sheaths that help us, it's going to then attack this sheath and then cause this nerve damage. So here we can see the cytokines are at this part of the myelin, which is targeting the cytotoxic T cell to come in. And here's the plasma cells, the antibodies that they produced. And this is going to target the B cells, the macrophages, and all of the other cells to come in. So looking at a healthy neuron, generally we have the protective myelin, there's no holes or tears or anything like that, no lesions on it. So this allows the signal to travel through uninterrupted across the axon, which is basically like the long cord attached to, oops, sorry about that, the long cord that attaches the cell body or the part that's in the brain, but also can be in the periphery, so your arms or legs. So this is where the signal starts and then we go all the way through to where the signal ends. So this is going to cause a sensory or motor response. So if you touch the table, you can feel the table. If you wanna move your arm up, your arm goes up. Basically that's the signal that's being sent. Now what happens when the myelin sheath is damaged? The signal gets disrupted and it gets distorted. So when I touch the table, I might not feel it. Or instead of feeling a normal touch sensory, I might feel a tingle or something that's itchy or pain. And sometimes it can be damaged to the point that you can't move it. So the motor function is disrupted. So if you wanna bring your arm upwards, you either might not be able to, or it might be like what I like to say is a clumsy motion. So you don't have all the full control over that motion that you originally had control over. So looking at symptoms of MS, so that brings us into this. You have problems with gait and that can lead to fall. So what that means is the motor function is disrupted. So now instead of being able to walk properly, sometimes if there's numbness in the leg or a joint, it can make it clumsy as I had mentioned. So it can be hard to walk and it can cause falls and also it can cause, um, there's a lot of damage that can be caused unfortunately and it can make daily living pretty hard. Um, some patients have to um, have therapy to try to get their fine motor to just to hold something. Um, it can be very difficult and it can be very stressful, but there are a lot of strategies to try to help this and a lot of ways to hopefully prevent this. And definitely in the future, we're hoping that there's going to be a lot of other ways to either fix or prevent the damage done. 
Um, as I had mentioned, the cells can attack the central nervous system. Well, that includes your optic nerves. So there's a lot of visual problems in MS. So whether it's blurry or spots in your vision or areas of your vision that you just can't see out of, whether it's like horizontal to like to the sides or up or down, there's a lot of paresthesias. What those are, are sensory damage to the nerve. So there's burning, tingling, numbness. You can have itching or prickling sensations. Um, I actually have a squeezing sensation in some of my like fingers, my arms. So it's very different. Um, you can also have issues with like cold or heat tolerance. So what might seem cold before now could feel freezing or what might have been warm could now feel really hot. So it's very interesting and different sensations that people feel depending on the specific nerve that's damaged or the specific part of a specific nerve that can be damaged. There's a lot of pain associated with that. Um, if you're having distorted signals, um, it can be detecting things that aren't painful as painful. Um, a lot of spasticity, which means that um, basically when the signals are sent, you can have like twitches or um, like muscles that are moving when they're not supposed to be. And that can cause a lot of like sore muscles and like what we would call like a knot in your muscle. So that can be kind of painful and definitely it's stressful and it's not very good to deal with a lot of times, but there are some medications that can be given to help with spasticity. Um, damage to your nerves can cause weakness. And one of the biggest things that's experienced by patients with MS is going to be fatigue. A lot of patients have fatigue and that's due to, if you think about it this way, your body is constantly fighting something. It's fighting itself. So not only is it trying to fight off something and it's causing this immune response, but now it's attacking its own cells. So when you have the flu or you have a cold, you feel tired because your immune system is fighting something. But if it's constantly fighting itself, you're all, if you're trying to go about your day and just you're just walking, you're going to work, you're going to school, you're already trying to put out a lot of energy. So if your body is fighting internally and you're trying to do things externally, it just causes a lot of tiredness and fatigue, which can lead to a secondary symptom here of depression. A lot of patients with MS get depressed because they don't feel good a lot. They're upset that they feel burdening, that they're causing a burden on the people around them because of their disabilities. And it can be really debilitating in a lot of situations. Um, bowel and bladder dysfunction can lead to recurrent UTIs or um, it says urinary calculi. Basically what that is, is kind of like hardened calcium stones in your urinary tract. And that can be really painful to excrete out of your body or when you're going to the bathroom when it comes out, basically. Um, osteoporosis is very common because when you're unable to use limbs or you use them less often, the body becomes weakened. So the muscles around it, the nerves, the bones, they get into a weakened state. And that can lead to a lot of other problems later on because if you're not moving a lot, you can get heart disease, diabetes, um, a lot of different disorders can be related to this. Even though they're not a cause of MS, they're complications that can happen later on down the road. So there are ways that you can try to help stay healthy. If your body is healthy and you have healthy um, lifestyle, then you're going to be able to fight off anything that's going on in your body better than you would prior to. So if you have a better diet, so well-balanced diets, avoid food triggers, which is really important, and avoid processed foods. And exercising, I'm sure everybody is, always hears this all the time, eat good and exercise, eat good and exercise. But really, it is the best way that you can yourself take control of your life and not have to rely on medications. Now, the medications are going to definitely help, but if you can do your own part, it increases the um, efficacy and it increases the chance that you're going to be healthier and have less attacks. And then one thing that I personally like to stress is prioritize sleep. I have, since I've been prioritizing my sleep, I have felt 10 times better. I, it's hard in pharmacy school to get a lot of sleep, definitely studying a lot and trying to balance social life and working and school. It can be difficult, but if you sleep enough, I am telling you, your body will feel so much better. When you have lack of sleep, your body can't heal itself in the way that it's supposed to. So when we're sleeping, that's basically our time where our body regenerates and it reduces inflammation and it can heal those damaged cells. If we're not sleeping, our cells aren't functioning like they're supposed to, and that can lead to more attacks and more damage later on down the road. One thing I wanted to mention is the autoimmune protocol. So this is basically a diet. Now I can't say for sure that it has proven effects, but it has been shown to help with symptoms. So if you remove all of these different groups, so we have grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, nightshade vegetables, which is like tomatoes, peppers, and potatoes, and other root vegetables that are similar. There's, there's a lot of them. I didn't really wanna mention all of them, but you can always look into it if you're interested in that. Um, there's eggs and dairy. So basically what you do is you eliminate all of these from your diet 
and then wait and see once if your symptoms are going away or not. And then you reintroduce these one food group at a time and see if you get those symptoms again. If you do, then you avoid that food and you just don't eat it. And then the other ones that aren't bothering you, you can reintroduce back into your diet and you can keep them in your diet. This way you're reducing inflammation and you're reducing any symptoms, whether it's nausea, um, headache, tiredness, a lot of them really can affect you. So if you wanted to as well, you could always get one of those allergy food tests and see what you're sensitive to. And you can remove those foods from your diet, that way you feel better. So how is MS diagnosed? There's different ways. It's kind of a diagnosis of ruling out other illnesses first. So I'll talk about this first, blood tests. Generally, blood tests are done first. You want to rule out other conditions like lupus, Shrogan's, vitamin or mineral deficiencies, some infections, and rare hereditary diseases that can affect your nervous system or can have similar symptoms to MS but that aren't really MS, kind of like a pseudo MS. Next, they're going to test your lumbar or your spinal tap. Um, this, I will say, is not fun. Um, it's kind of painful and it's kind of nerve wracking because they're sticking a giant needle in your spine. But basically what they do is put a needle in between your lumbar disc, so your lower back, they're gonna go in to where the spinal cord is and they're going to remove some cerebral spinal cord fluid. And that's basically the fluid that surrounds your spinal cord, it surrounds your brain, it's kind of like an insulation for the brain and the spinal cord and it carries different proteins and different um, like things that your body needs kind of to work properly <laughs> and for your brain to work how it needs to. But what you'll see in a lot of MS patients is that they'll have proteins called oligoclonal bands and they might have elevated, elevated immunoglobulins. So immunoglobulins are proteins that our immune system generates. And a lot of times when you have an autoimmune disorder, the IgG and IgA will be elevated. MRIs will be done to see if you have lesions in your brain or in your spinal cord. So in order to be diagnosed with MS officially, you have to have greater than two lesions, greater than or equal to two lesions in two separate areas. So whether it's in two different parts of the brain, two different parts of the spinal cord, or if you have one in each or every other, it, it just depends. As long as you have two lesions and they have to be greater than three millimeters to five millimeters in size for them to be considered significant. Anything under three millimeters in size is not considered significant. And that is because, as I had mentioned before, migraines can show a similar, um, a similar, <laughs> similar presentation. And they can be under the three millimeters. So they can cause those micro lesions that look like they can be MS, but really it's just the damage due to the migraine. And I'm gonna go ahead on and transfer this over to Flavia. Okay, next we're going to talk about the different types of MS. So we're going to start off with clinical, clinically isolated syndrome, CIS. So prior to an MS diagnosis, sometimes patients um, present with possible MS, and this is a category called CIS, where the patient can experience symptoms for the first time, and then an MRI should show evidence, um, but however, diagnosis can sometimes not be confirmed. And disease-modifying therapies, also called DMTs, can be used for CIS to delay um, the prevention or eventual diagnosis of MS. Um, while there is no way to predict um, with any certainty of how an individual's disease will progress, there are four basic uh, types of MS. And the first one is called relapsing or emitting MS, RRMS. Uh, second one, pro primary progressive MS, PPMS, uh, secondary progressive MS, SPMS, and then finally, um, progressive relapsing MS, also known as PRMS. Hey, Flavia, I just wanted to remind our audience, if they do have questions, um, they can type them in the, in the box um, as in live time as you guys are presenting. Sorry, okay. go ahead. Thank you. So relapsing remitting MS. So relapsing remitting MS is defined as a relapse or worsening of symptoms that can last to greater than or equal to 24 hours. And it is clearly defined by um, attacks or new or increasing neurological symptoms. And also these attacks can be followed by periods of partial or complete recovery missions. And during these periods, uh, the symptoms may disappear and or sometimes even continue and become and stay there forever. Um, there is, however, with this type of MS, no progression, no apparent progression of the disease during the periods of remission. And this is the most common type of MS um, that people are diagnosed with. 
which also is, um, it portrays in the graph on the right that the activity can occur with our RRMS over time. So following a relapse, the new symptoms may disappear without causing an increase in level of disability, or the new symptoms may partially disappear, resulting in an increase in disability. The next type of MS we're going to discuss is primary progressive MS, PPMS. And this is characterized by worsening neurological function from the onset of symptoms without early relapse or remissions. And usually about 10% of patients who are diagnosed fall within this category of MS. The graph on the right also shows the activity that can occur with this type of MS. And it can have brief periods where the disease is stable with or without relapses or activity on MRI. And then as well as periods when there is an increase in disability um, with or without new relapses or lesions on MRIs. Next, we're gonna talk about secondary progressive MS, which is known as SPMS, and it follows um, an initial relapsing remitting course. Um, some people who are diagnosed with RRMS will eventually transition um, to secondary progressive course in which there is a progressive worsening of function over time. And then um, with this patient population, there would there will be periods where, where no longer um, remission where remission no longer occurs. And then again, the graph on the right also displays this course, the course of this activity. Next is progressive relapsing MS, PRMS. And about 5% of individuals are initially diagnosed with this less common form of MS. Um, this type of MS steadily worsens from the onset, but symptoms flare-ups with or without remission are also present. However, um, different forms of MS further are studied and reclassified, so the label for PRMS is being used less frequently now. Next, we will be dis discussing the treatment categories for MS. So starting off with the treatment of acute exacerbations, um, which acute exacerbations are defined as a relapse um, or attack or flare up. And this, in this occurrence of new symptoms or worsening of old symptoms. So for example, a patient can have an exacerbation um, of symptoms such as numbness, um, but they can also have more severe um, exacerbations involving loss of vision and poor balance, and this can interfere in the patient's overall ability to function. Um, so usually a short course of high um, dose corticosteroids are used to reduce inflammation. The most common treatment regimen is usually um, IV solumedrol or oral delta zone. And next we're gonna talk about disease modifying therapies. So DMTs, um, they're not a cure for MS, but they can reduce how many relapses someone has and how serious they are. Um, so we will be talking about the different types there. And then next we're gonna, um, and I'm just gonna touch base on some of the symptom management that can be achieved. Um, there's agents such as anti specific agents, sorry. Um, such as baclofen and diazepam, and are, are frequently used with, in patients who have MS and who experience spasticity, a disorder of voluntary movement caused by damage to the central nervous system. And then we also have anti-inflammatory agents, um, such as Motrin or Advil, and can be used to treat pain associated with MS. And then also um, depressants such as Prozac or Cymbalta can be used to treat depression in patients who have MS. And here is an overview of the DMTs that are used to treat MS, um, which includes injectables, um, oral formulation, and um, infusions. So to dive further into the um, disease modifying therapies, we're first gonna talk about the injectables. So this table includes injection medication and dosing recommendations. Um, and also in the last column is, are the indications for which type of MS they are used in. Um, and in the next couple slides, I will further discuss most of these treatments in further detail.
So first we're going to talk about interferon beta and it has many different brand names. Um, and this medication works by um, several anti-inflammatory um, mechanisms. And it is indicated for the treatment of relapsing forms of MS, including that the CIS and RRMS, and also active SPMS. Um, dosing is available as intramuscular or subcutaneous formulations, which um, intramuscular goes straight into the muscle and then subcutaneous under the skin. Um, and then some of the side effects that can be experienced by patients taking um, interferon therapy are flu-like symptoms. So um, you can experience fever, chills, uh, fatigue, body aches, also injection site reactions um, and depression as well and hepatotoxicity, which is damage to the liver. Um, from clinical trials, um, this medication indicates that there is a reduction in relapse rate about 30%. The next DMT is known as glutaramir acetate, also known as capoxone or glatopa. Um, so this medication is a synthetic protein um, that simulates myelin basic protein, a component of myelin um, which insulates um, the nerve fiber in the brain and spinal cord. It is indicated for the same um, types of MS as interferon. And Glutamine comes as a solution to un inject under the skin, which is subcutaneously three times per week, given at least 48 hours apart. So it can be taken Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, the side effects. So some of the side effects of glutaramir are injection site reactions, um, shortness of breath, um, chest pain, and also we're gonna um and also some of the clinical trials do indicate that um glutaramir uh, reduces the relapse rate about 29 percent compared to placebo next we're going to talk about oral formulation so this includes tablets or capsules so here is another table um which has a comprehensive list of all the oral formulations and indications for MS. So for example, Abagio, Jelenia, and Mycet, and Zaposia are taking once per day. Um, and then there's also Tecfidera and Barfiratam, which are taken twice per day as well. I'm sorry, the first ones are taking once per day, and then the second ones that I mentioned, Tecfidera and Barfiratam, are taking twice per day. And then we have um, Mevinclad, which is a short course therapy. Um, now we're going to talk about teraflunamide, um, brand name Abagio, and it works by reducing the number of immune cells, including destructive immune cells, um, which can cause MS flare ups. Um, it is also used for the same indication as the previous um, medications I mentioned, and this medication is taken orally um, once daily. Some side effects of teraflunamide includes headaches, um, liver damage, low phosphate levels, um, and alopecia, which is hair loss. And this medication also has a black box warning for um, liver toxicity or terito and teratogenicity. So um, it must exclude pregnancy and both male and female uh, female partners must use contraception. And um, so some considerations for this medication um, is that the patient must be screened for TB prior, tuberculosis prior to therapy. And also um, patients cannot um, receive live vaccinations while on therapy. And the next medication is dimethyl fumarate, um, also known as Tecfidera. So the way that this medication works is by activating the uh, a nuclear transcriptional pathway. And um, also it treats the same types of MS as the medications I mentioned before. Um, 
And with this medication, it is an oral capsule and it does have an initial dose. Um, and then after uh, seven days, it, it is increased to a maintenance dose of 200 milligrams twice daily. And some side effects of this medication are um, flushing, um, increased risk of infection, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, and also risk for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, encephalopathy, which is known as PML. And in the next slide, we will further discuss what PML is. And based off of clinical trials, um, it shows that Tecfidera has a 44% reduce um, in relapse rates. And next, Alexis will discuss PML. Okay, so PML, or progressive multifocal and leukoencephalopathy, is a rare disease caused by the polio, polyoma virus JC. So what the JC virus is, it's actually dormant in 70 to 90% of people in the world. So it probably is just like a common cold that we get, and then after it's gone, it doesn't cause any more symptoms. In most people, there's no symptoms. Now, what happens though, is that when you're on an immunosuppressive agent, the immune system becomes weakened and it no longer can suppress this dormant virus. And in some patients on immunosuppressive therapy, they get what's called PML. And PML is basically when the JC virus kind of takes over and causes an infection. And this infection targets the myelin and the CNS and it can do things very similar to what MS does, only this is much more severe. If you look at the image to the right here, so see how this part is white? That's showing an area where there's a lesion on the brain. So that's damage, there's swelling, there's scarring, and this is all damage to the CNS or the central nervous system, as well as here and here, you can see there's some damage here. So when there's this mass area of damage, it can cause rapid disability and it can often lead to death. So it's something very serious. And even though it's very rare, it has to be monitored for and a lot of different therapies that are given to patients. And this can actually occur over weeks to months. So it's a very acute reaction. It's not like MS where it can cause damage over years. This is weeks to months and time period. So let's talk about fingolimod. Now I personally have MS and this is the medication that I'm on. So I might be a little bit partial to this drug because it has worked very well for me, but there are a lot of different therapies that have shown similar efficacy or better efficacy in some patients. But for me, this has worked very well. So fingolimod is Joanya. What it does is it prevents your lymphocytes or your immune cells from leaving the lymph nodes. So what I like to say is that they're on house arrest. Basically they're stuck inside the lymph nodes or their house and they can't get out and wreak havoc on the central nervous system. This is indicated for all relapsing forms of MS. So that includes cysts, relapsing remittent and secondary progressive. But what's unique about fingolimod is it's the only FDA approved medication for children that have the adolescent MS. So it's approved for patients greater than or equal to 10 years of age, which I found was very interesting. And there was a study called the Paradigm study, which I'm gonna jump ahead for a second. And this shows that compared to Avonex or the interferon beta um, inhibitors, that there was an 85.7% of patients that were relapsed free on Jelenia compared to 38.8% of Avonex patients after two years. And this was in the pediatric population. So prior to Jelenia's approval, Avonex was the first line therapy for pediatric MS. But after the study was done and they showed just how much better Jelenia treated the pediatric MS, this is now the only FDA approved treatment and the one that is now prescribed for all pediatric patients. So looking at the dosing, it is one capsule daily. Typically it's 0.56 milligrams, but in children under 40 kilograms, it's actually going to be 0.25 milligrams. Now the catch with fingolimod is that there is some serious effects with the heart that can occur. There's also risk of really damaging the liver and there's risk of what's called macular edema. So prior to starting fingolimod, you have to have, um, you have to be checked for diabetes and if you've ever had macular edema, you have to check and see if you have any cardiac conditions. They do an EKG prior to starting and after starting. And you wanna make sure that there's no bradycardia, which is like really slow heart rate. Um, 
And atrioventricular block is a serious condition that causes heart failure. So you have to make sure that you don't have any of these pre-existing conditions prior to starting. Your first dose that you take, you have to sit at the facility that's giving you your medication for six hours so they can monitor you. They keep a blood pressure cuff on you and they keep an EKG on you. So they're testing your blood pressure and they're testing your conduction to make sure that nothing's happening while you're on it. As long as you're okay after that first 24 hours, generally you should be okay on this medication. And I did wanna mention that this also increases the risk of PML. So there's a few medications that do increase the risk. And then as I had mentioned, here's some of the clinical trials and it just shows that Jelenia has been very efficient and has worked pretty well in a lot of patient populations. Next we have saponamod or mazent, and this also is what fingolimod is called an S1P phosphate receptor. So it holds those cells in the lymph nodes. So saponamod is going to have the same mechanism of action, only this also binds to one and five. So it's not just receptor one, it also binds to five. This has been newly approved and it was released in 2019. Um, it has very similar side effect profiles, very similar efficacy to Jelenia. Since it hasn't been out very long, there's not a lot of data to show how it's truly affected people in a real world setting. We just have the clinical data to show that it's effective. It's treatment, or the treatment is for the same patient population, all relapsing forms of MS. And then this is just to show that you have to get a, so what's, interesting about this is you have to get a genotype done so they have to test your genetics and they have to see this liver enzyme right here you have to see which type you have so this gets really into like some pretty interesting stuff for genetics you have to definitely check different ones so there's different phenotypes you'll see so here's the one one phenotype one two 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 and you have one three and two three now there's different dosing based off of which genotype you have for this liver enzyme and genotype is basically like your specific code for it and then here's some clinical trials down here, just mentioning how it is effective. So 70%, 72% reduction in lesions after three months compared to placebo. And what's interesting about saponamod is that it has shown a 26% reduction in disease progression in secondary progressive MS after six months versus placebo. So this is in the most efficient and efficacious drug so far for secondary progressive MS. Now going on to some infusion treatments. So here is a table of some of the different infusion treatments. So there's Lemtrada, Novantron, Tysabri, and Ocrevus. Now I'm only gonna talk about um, Lemtrada, Tysabri, and Ocrevus. This one isn't used as much because it's very toxic. So this is like a last line therapy. It has a maximum dose that you can have while you're on it. So 140 milligrams per meter squared, which is basically your body surface area. And that's over a two to three year span. So this is basically once everything is failing and your MS is still progressing, you can try this, but you can only have a, this maximum dose of it because it causes irreversible damage to your heart and other organs. So Elemtuzumab or Campath or Lemtrada is a monoclonal antibody. So it goes against CD52, which is basically like a biomarker that's attached to both B and T cells. And it targets them and it eliminates them from the circulation. So this is approved for relapsing um, MS, and it's generally safe for people that have failed other treatments. So some side effects, it's risk of PML. Um, it can cause some like feelings of dizziness, tiring, weakness, flushing. There's some pain associated with it, changes in your taste. There's a lot of different side effects for this medication, which is why it's more so one of the last line therapies. Um, it does show that relapses are reduced by 66% compared to placebo and that it is more effective than Avonex. Nidalizumab or Tysabri has shown to be very effective, but unfortunately this has the highest risk of causing PML, the disease that I had mentioned earlier. So compared to placebo, this has 82% reduction of the T2 lesions. So that's like the lesions that the um, immune cells cause on the brain. So 83% compared to placebo. This is actually one of the highest ones I've seen so far, but unfortunately it can't be used in a lot of patients due to the JC virus being present. And I just wanted to go back really quick. So natalizumab works by binding to alpha-4 beta-1 integrin and it blocks VCAM1. So I know those probably don't mean much, but that's the mechanism of action that they take. And it leads to um, reducing the migration of these lymph cells or our white blood cells and our immune cells. It stops them from getting into the central nervous system. And this is also used for relapsing forms of MS. So going on to ocrelizumab or ocrevus. Now this is the current mainstay therapy 
for progressive and for serious MS disorders. Now, this has kind of been like the golden therapy that has come out recently because it is shown to be more efficacious than most every other MS treatment. So I read a study that had said it was better than 10 treatments at reducing disease severity, and it was better than 12 treatments at reducing the amount of lesions after two years. So this is a monoclonal antibody directed against CD20. And this basically stops the cells from going into the central nervous system and it attacks them and destroys the immune cells that are causing damage. So if we go onto the next page here, I just wanted to show this is the um, part that I said about it's better than 10 treatments, including placebo, which generally you would assume. But the only issues with um, Ocrevus is that it does increase the risk of PML. And specifically, I wanted to mention malignancies. So that's cancers. Um, because it depletes the cells so well that it does increase your risk of other infections, of upper respiratory, of UTIs, and of um, flu symptoms. There are a lot of things that can go on with this, but it's just, it works so well that it's been used a lot recently. And one thing I did want to mention that's unique about this, it is the only current treatment for progressive MS. It's the only medication that has shown any significant benefit in treating pr primary progressive MS. So this has been wonderful since it has come out for patients with that disorder because it's been very hard to find treatments because nothing was really working. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch off really quick. So I'm going to talk about risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, also known as REM. So Alexis mentioned some of the medications before, such as um, Lemtrada and Tysabri. And these medications have programs which are made to ensure the benefits of the medications outweigh the risks. So um, if you can see on the right-hand side, the REMS action that is taken for Lemtrada is um, just to inform patients of serious um, risk that may be caused by Lemtrada and also to make sure that the prescribers um, who prescribe Lemtrada are certified and they submit the documentation and periodic monitoring that is required for that medication. And then for Tysabri, it's um, to inform the patients of uh, PML, which we discussed before, and um, to warn against concurrent medication use, such as um, antineoplastic agents or other immunosuppressant agents. Um, and also to promote and diagnose, uh, to promote early diagnosis of PML. Hi, this is Larissa. The charts we're gonna go over list the medications for MS currently in phase three or phase two clinical trials, which are the late stages of research required before the FDA may consider them to be made prescribable. They generally work to reduce the immune system's actions against myelin. For your reference, we've also included more in-depth information about the target area within the immune system that these medications act on. So tolibrutinib is anticipated to be able to be prescribed for relapsing and progressive forms of MS in October, 2025. Its most common side effects are going to be headache, chest infections, and common colds. Mastinib is anticipated to be able to be prescribed for progressive forms of MS in July 2022, and its most common side effects so far include tiredness, weakness, rash, nausea, fluid retention, and diarrhea. Evobrutinib is anticipated to be available for relapsing remitting MS in fall of 2024. Its most common side effects so far include common colds and increased workload for the liver. Our baclofen is anticipated to become available for treating muscle spasms associated with MS and does not have an estimated time of approval yet. Our baclofen appears to most commonly cause muscle weakness and urinary tract infections. Phenobrutinib is anticipated to become available for primary progressive MS and its most common side effects include nausea, headache, anemia, and upper respiratory tract infections. So ibutilast is being tested to treat progressive forms of MS by slowing progression, and it's most likely to cause side effects of nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, depression, rash, and tiredness, or weakness. Pronesimod is actually newly available as of this March, so March 2021, for clinically isolated syndrome and relapsing forms of MS. 
is most likely to cause shortness of breath, dizziness, increased workload for the liver, and slowed heart rate. Bexavertine and the following therapies are being tested in phase two trials, so they're a little further off, but they're being tested for improving myelin repair, which is anticipated to help reduce the side effects of MS in general and hopefully help reverse some of the signs of the disease over time. Bexavertine is the most likely to cause cholesterol, reduced numbers of white blood cells, hypothyroidism, itchy rash, headaches, vomiting, and diarrhea. Clomastine so far is most likely to cause drowsiness. Opicinumab has not been known to cause any specific side effects so far. And this one's interesting because it's actually a vaccine, but you don't take Neurovax to prevent MS. You get it once you already have it to prevent secondary progressive MS from uh, progressing further. So far, the only side effect with Neurovax is a sore arm. Ubotuximab targets the immune system is being tested for a treatment for relapsing forms of MS. It's anticipated to become available this fall and the most common side effects are infusion related reactions such as a rash and headaches and tiredness or weakness. Tamelumab is an injection that boosts myelin repair just like the oral therapies we mentioned that do the same earlier, and it's currently being tested to treat relapsing, remitting, and progressive forms of MS. It's the most likely to cause cold-like symptoms as side effects. All right, and let's finish out this presentation. So here we have prescription coverage and patient assistance programs. So I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. I just wanted to mention that there are different patient assistance programs for each drug. So as we mentioned, we have Abagio, Lemtrada, Avonex, Tecfidera, Tysabri, Copaxone, Jelenia, Mavenclad, and Rebif, Mazent, and then Ocrevus. So all of these have their own specific programs. There's a number to contact them and a website. Now, when you are prescribed one of these medications, they will follow up with you every so many months, and they'll check on you and see how you're doing, how the medication's working, any side effects, and there's a phone number you can call for any questions. They also have um, prescription assistance programs that are within these programs. So not only do they check on you and your symptoms and making sure the drug works for you, but they also make sure that you can get it. A lot of these programs, if you make under a certain amount yearly, you'll have zero copay. And other ones, they give you very significant reductions, depending, even if you don't make a little bit. Like if you make a lot of money, you can still get reductions on these medications, depending on how much they cost you yearly. Some of these can cost upwards of $100,000 a year. So it definitely is pretty costly. It's very hard for a lot of patients to pay for that if they did not have these assistance programs. And so, Alexis, right quick, uh, while you were talking about the patient assistance programs, which I'm glad you added to this presentation, um, I just want to stress to the audience, the ones she is referring to are generally, generally found on the manufacturer's websites. Um, just wanted to verify that. Um, is, is that the ones you were referring to, Alexis, the manufacturer yes. um, assistance programs? Yeah, so these are through the manufacturers that develop the drugs and each of the drugs, like some of them have the same ass assistance program. So like, for example, looking at Abagio and Lemtrada, it's called MS one-to-one. -one. So these will be available on the manufacturer's website, but also each drug has their own specific website that will provide this information right. for you as well. And that's not limited, just so our audience knows too, that's just one specific program, but there are many different assistance programs out there for these really expensive drugs. Yes, for sure. There are a lot of different assistance programs, and even you can talk to um, like case managers and see if there's um, any other assistance that you can achieve based off of your income or the areas that you live in. I did want to mention this ACTHAR support and access program and what they help is for acute attacks. So when you're having an attack, this isn't going to help with like preventative medication, but if you're in the hospital and you're currently having an acute attack and you're getting an IV corticosteroid or an immunoglobulin therapy replacement or IVIG, or if you're getting plasmapheresis, which is a plasma exchange, they're going to help you with those hospital expenses. And this is very important because the medication assistance programs for your specific disease modifying therapy doesn't help you with your hospital stays. So this is definitely beneficial when you're having an attack. And then next, I wanted to talk about some symptom specific programs. 
So pseudo ball bar effect. Um, so this is, um, it's like, like I said, it's pseudo. So it's not actually symptoms that are occurring, but it feels like it is. And it could be um, really detrimental to patient's recovery. And it's, it's just unfortunate to have symptoms and side effects that are affecting your daily lifestyle. So you can contact them. They're going to help you with these symptoms that you're feeling, and they're going to help you with um, payment for them, as well as like support systems to help you with these symptoms. Also, Botox can help with bladder dysfunction or spasticity. And this program will help you to pay for that, as well as give you places to go get these treatments done. And then Ampira, it helps you with walking. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of gait disturbances in patients with MS, and they can have issues with walking or daily life functions. And they're going to help you with um, assistance, finding these programs and paying for these therapy programs. And that's honestly what we have so far. Um, if you have any questions for us, please do not be afraid to ask. And we are open books when it comes to, at least I know I'm an open book when it comes to my experience with MS and the different medications and my experience with specialty pharmacies. Um, I know I kind of didn't really mention this much in the presentation, but specialty pharmacies are going to be dealing with all these medications. They're very expensive. They're very specific for disease states. Specialty pharmacies are going to specialize in these medications and in these disease states to give everybody that has these conditions a kind of a place to go to and to talk with somebody who's specializing in it that knows about it and that knows the most about these medications. It's very hard to get these medications paid for a lot of times through insurances and specialty pharmacies are going to focus on getting this paid for for you, finding those assistance programs if you can't find them yourself or if you're having any issues with them. And they're going to be there for you to talk to if you have any questions about your disease state, about your medications. So it's definitely a very good resource for you outside of these patient assistance programs. You can just contact whatever pharmacy you're getting your medication through, and they're going to help you as best as they can. Okay, thank you ladies. I think we're going to open it up to a few questions right now. We just have a few minutes left. Um, and I am glad you, again, brought up the patient assistance programs. Um, that is also something I'm pretty well versed in and we have that as a resource for patients and providers here at ADA um, that they can call and ask for assistance or information about the assistance programs available for certain medications. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, if you have, if you are, um, have any questions, just type them in the box and we're gonna, we're just gonna answer a few right now. Um, ladies, do you know anything regarding these medications and if there's any data with the current COVID vaccine um, for some of these MS treatments, or have you read anything about the issues that may have arisen in the, over the course of the last year? So I haven't heard any issues of getting the vaccine while you have MS. According to um, the Mellon Center at Cleveland Clinic, as well as the MS Society, they do still push for you to get the vaccine. I haven't seen any issues with the efficacy of it or it not working as well in these patients. Now, granted, when patients are immunosuppressed, there is a chance that the antibodies or the, um, the body's response to the vaccines might not work as well as a healthy individual. But because it isn't a live vaccine, there's no contraindications or anything that says not to get the vaccine as of right now. Okay, thanks. Um... What, with the exacerbations, how long do they usually, they generally last? And I know that's kind of a, a loaded question because that depends on what's going on, but if you had to guess. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So in order for it to be considered a true attack, it has to last for longer than 24 hours and it has to be sustained symptoms. Now these exacerbations can last as little as 24 hours or in some patients they can last multiple weeks. Um, I will tell you, I had an attack back in October of 2019, and for about three weeks, I was experiencing different symptoms in different locations, and some of them went away, some of them stayed. It just depends on the location of your lesion and how much your immune system, I don't want to say this way, but how much your immune system hates you during that time period, because sometimes <laughs> it just goes crazy, and it might be for a couple of days, it might be for a few weeks. Okay. 
Um, just like one or two more questions here. So with the genetic testing having to be done for the sipinamidol, am I saying that right? I'm oh, saying yeah. that wrong. The, the sip, am I, Sipinamod, sip, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Is it covered, generally covered by insurance? So the genetic it, testing part. So because the therapy is so new, it most likely is not on a lot of insurance formularies. I will say it's probably not a first line therapy and it's probably more so saved for patients that have failed other therapies. At that point, insurance companies are usually more willing to cover different um, testing and different procedures that need to be done if it means that it's going to be more beneficial to the patient. Um, I know that the, the insurance that I'm on, I'm required to fail two therapies before I can be on Ocrevus. So even though Ocrevus has shown to be superior to everything else, basically, a lot of insurance companies want to go with the more current main therapies and the guidelines before they go with these newer ones that seem to be better. Yeah, and we're not going to get in and open that can of worms regarding step therapy, which you really just mentioned that having to um, try medications and fail because that just turns me red but in regards to insurance companies. But we're going to have a, a webinar on step therapy um, later on this year. But that's from what I've gathered, it's been kind of an issue with a lot of the autoimmune um, medications because a lot of the autoimmune medications are, are pretty expensive. And we're talking about across the board with all 90 to 100 different types of autoimmune diseases, not just, <clears throat> excuse me, MS by itself. So um, with that, it's looking like we're getting toward the end here. Um, and I wanted to thank you ladies for, for being here and doing this, this talk this afternoon. And I wanted to thank our audience for listening today. And don't forget to tune in to our upcoming webinars on April the 28th for Liquid Gold and Open Forum on IVIG, IVIG standing for intravenous immunoglobulin with Dr. Michael Regas, so, who's a Pharma D, and also May 21st for Sjogren's Syndrome. It's not just dry eyes and dry mouth with Dr. Delphin Santos. Also, please take a few minutes to fill out our survey after the conclusion of today's webinar to help us better serve our community and give us vital feedback. And if you have any questions or need additional resources, please visit our website at www.godoada.org. This is Lauren Dunlop for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us.